You have a unique distinction, Jim, of being the obsessive <laughs> perfectionist. And I say it with respect. Well, thank you. Well, I do, being aware of what you have just put of your life into mm -hmm. the making of mm -hmm. this motion picture. When did this movie first occur to you? When did you know you were going to do it? It was five years ago. I, I, I had um, you know, been, been studying Titanic, the history of it a little bit, and I'd been following the, you know, the discovery of the shipwreck and all that. And I just sort of got this idea to do a love story set on Titanic with the, the wraparound, you know, the bookend of the, uh, of the shipwreck. And I literally sat down to make some notes on this for the first time. And the next day, I got in the mail an invitation that was a black card that said in red letters, Titanica. And it was an invitation to uh, uh, a friend of mine was the, the, the uh, uh, underwater photographer on the abyss. And he had done a special on the making of the IMAX film. And so I went to see that, and I saw these two Russian submarines, and I said, I can use those. <laughs> you know, as the great opportunist, uh, I, I said, I can use those. I can go to Titanic. And so uh, the next day, or, or within a few days, we were on a plane to Moscow to go make the deal for the submarines. And, and then uh, it took a while to actually get the film started. I actually made true lies in the, in the meantime. But it's been three solid years for me uh, working on this picture. You made 12 dives. Mm -hmm to the site mm -hmm. of what now is the burial ground of the Titanic. Right, right. But Jim, what was the, the evening, what were the circumstances where you found yourself alone in a room after a dive and mm. overcome and you began sobbing? Well, you know, I think it has to do with the way people actually perceive uh, events as opposed to the way they're sort of shown in, in the movies. You would expect that the moment Titanic materialized out of the darkness would be such a profoundly emotional experience. But in fact, it was like a space mission. And we were, we, were, we were landing on the moon. And we were very caught up in technical things and watching the sonar and figuring out how to do the shots. And it was really a delayed reaction, having spent time at the shipwreck, having sat on the deck of the ship, having imagined people coming and going through the doors and behind the windows that you see the glass still in the, still in the windows after the ship has plunged you know, two and a half miles down, essentially almost to another world in a way, um, and just, uh, it, was, it was a delayed effect, you know, coming back up to the, to the mothership and just being alone and letting it sort of, you know, uh, almost all these feelings just sort of cascade through me. And it, it, um, it, it gave me this kind of conviction to do the film right. You know, I mean, I think if I was ever a perfectionist and, and ever compulsive before, it was amplified on this movie because of that. Because I was dealing with a real event, I was dealing with with a subject that a lot of people had thought about and written about and cared about a great deal. And so, uh, you know, I, I wanted to be able to contribute something new to it, uh, uh, a more lucid visualization, if you will. Did you know when you saw the tape footage from the dives that you were going to find a way artistically to incorporate the actual footage into the motion picture so that we see things mm -hmm. that are, in fact, the real things? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, that was. When, when I saw the, you know, the, the doors and the woodwork and the chandeliers and all the things that were coming into our lights as our, as our robot camera explored the and interior. And that mantle. Yes, yes, I know. It was, it, we were so excited when we saw that because we knew that it was, it was like the first pictures from the inside of King Tut's tomb or something like that. And uh, I had to find a way to integrate it into the film and not just sort of show it, but to integrate it emotionally, which is why um, you know, I, have, I have Rose at the age of 101 looking at the screen and imagining that she's stepping back through the entry doors into the ship. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and it, it takes her mind back. And so in a way, it becomes a kind of a conduit for the audience to go back into, into 1912 to the ship in her, in her glory, in her, in her few brief days of glory. You're a man who's always been moved and affected creatively by music. And one mm -hmm. thinks of the effect. Kubrick's 2001 had on you as a young person. Right, right. And while you sat through it 10 times. Right. right. What music helped you while you worked all this time on you Titanic? You did go back to your notes, didn't you? You've, you've, yes. No, you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, um, music is very important. I mean, interestingly on this one, because I knew I had to, as a writer, open myself up emotionally in a way that I had never done before in order, in order to write this script. Um, I, I tried to find I, I listened to film soundtracks and things that, that were, you know, that were, you know, romantic films and that. But I actually wound up, surprisingly enough, listening to a lot of Enya, because there was a there's a sense of a, of a kind of a timelessness in her music. And I'm, I'm not not that I was ever even really necessarily a big Enya fan, but I was trying to find the voice 
for this particular film, and every film is different, and something that would, that, you know, and there was, there was such sort of longing and loss in some of the music, and the Celtic theme that ran through it suddenly struck me as correct because of the, of the large Irish contingent on the, on the ship, and of course being steerage, they were, they, they were decimated in the, in, in the sinking. Relatively few of them survived. And so uh, it just struck me as this kind of very, very haunting sound. And when I discussed with the composer, James Horner, um, you know, what the music for this film should sound like, the first thing he said quite independently was, you know, I have a crazy idea. And I said, what is it? He said, I'm, I'm hearing a kind of Enya-like sound using human voice and Celtic instrumentation. And I was like, you're hired. <laughs> it wasn't just like that. It was amazing. And we had this great six-month collaboration on the film where I think he's composed absolutely spectacular music. Because it's big, but it's always somehow personal or somehow always intimate. You know, it has the majesty, but it doesn't get swept away with, with huge, you know, violins and, and strings and all the sort of overproduced period score stuff that you would normally associate with a film like this. Filmmaker Jim Cameron found out that gender and class played a very big role in the tragedy that was the Titanic. Titanic can be viewed on many levels, as many as you're prepared to participate in. Exactly. You've been influenced all of your life by David Lean, by films like Gone with the Wind, mm -hmm. Dr. Zhivago. Mm -hmm. You wanted this to be your intimate epic. Mm -hmm. But those Irish died yeah. for another important reason that you articulate. Yes, exactly. The, the class, class structure. and culture mm -hmm. and gender. Right, right. Well, it's, it, it's fascinating what happened on Titanic. Uh, because it, it's, it's a very amplified version of kind of the world that we still live in. You see, the, you see the, 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 the repression of women very pronounced in that time. You know, women couldn't even vote in, in, the, in the, the US and Canada and, and England. At that time, they were disenfranchised. And uh, they were treated as second class citizens, objects of beauty. They had to wear corsets so that they looked like these kind of doll figures. And they were not taken seriously or, or at eye level in, in, in the conversations with gentlemen who all went off to their, to their smoking room you know, to really plan the, the, the events of the world. On that April day in 1912 when the Titanic sank, the political activist Emma Goldman was yes. giving a lecture in Denver. Yeah. The suffragettes were marching. Women were fighting yes, for their yes, right yes. to exist. And yes. Emma Goldman said, Women and children first, a disgrace. Yes. The women should have died with the people the, with they the love. That's right, exactly. And I think you would find that today more so. I, I, um, but but uh, you know, at that time, you know, it was a it was a you know, Emma Goldman was was one of the one of the great vocalists for female equality at, at that time. Probably the, the most notable one. And I read a lot of, of her of her stuff, and, and it, it really made me aware of of the struggle. It was the start of, the, of this great political struggle, at least o overtly. Um, you know, uh, the men were in charge in 1912. I mean, just flat out, they were running the world. And so they created this worldview in which the women were inferior and required protection. No woman could go unescorted, or as they said in 1912, unprotected, you know. So that when the men screwed up and ran their big, you know, symbol of, of, of male conquest of the elements into an iceberg and it started to sink, they had no choice but to step back from the lifeboats and allow the women to live. So in a way they were they were hoist on their own petard, you know. They were killed by their own they were killed by their own worldview. And I love that, you know, all these sort of men standing around in their in their tuxes looking at each other going, going what the hell went wrong, old man? <laughs> this is not supposed to be happening. <laughs> um, and so Rose, you know, our, our, young, our young heroine, is trying to, to burst out you know, of, this, of this repression, this gilded cage. So that, you know, that's an interesting time. And then, of course, you have the, the class system working at the same time as well. It was a very pronounced class structure in America as well as, as, as England. You know, we associate class structure with England, but in America it was the same thing. You had these, this incredible wealth this in, uh, uh, incredibly uh, refined elite, uh, and then of course you had the, the sort of the, the, the great unwashed, the, the working populace, and you know the, the gulf between the haves and the have-nots was very great. But I think one of the one of the, the great metaphors of Titanic is that if Titanic is the world, and and a story of Titanic therefore is about the end of the world, then it can be seen as a kind of microcosm. And in our world right now, the gulf between the haves and the have-nots is just as great as as it's ever been. You know, there are still, you know, hundreds of millions of people on the, on the brink of starvation, and yet great concentrations of wealth and, and, and power. So this is the eternal, you know, this is, this is human nature as it will always be. 
So that's why the Titanic story still has as much weight today as it, as it did in, in 1912. When we return, Jim Cameron on the intimacy behind the epic. It seems to me as a moviegoer and an enthusiast mm -hmm. that your greatest moments happen as they often do in your work, in your use of the close-up, and in this case, with the luminous mm -hmm. Kate Winslet, right, right. Leonardo DiCaprio. But again, Jim, mm -hmm. what you do with the faces of Frances Fisher right. as the mother and right. Kathy Bates right. 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 as the unsinkable Molly Brown are incredibly rewarding. Thank you. Uh, that, that's, that's, a, that's a great compliment, because what we really set out to do here was make, make an actor's picture and, and to get into the, you know, almost in a way, a great close-up takes you inside the mind and inside the heart of that, of that person. Um, and, of course, a great actor can project that without appearing to do anything. You know, they're not, it's not almost that they're doing anything overt, but you know what they're feeling, you know what they're thinking. And Kate's like that, of course. You always, you always know what her character's thinking somehow, and she appears to be doing very little. Uh, it's a fascinating thing to watch. It was, it was a great joy to edit this film because I had so much good material. I mean, the stuff that's on the floor is better than a, a lot of stuff that's in, in some, of, some of my other films, you know? Uh, and the <laughs> stuff that's in the film, I, I, I treasure because I really, I really think these actors, these actors did it. But, you know, part of what we set out to do was to take the audience through the screen barrier and give them a subjective um, experience of this great, you know, moment in history. Uh, and the way you do that, ironically, I think, the way you, the way you find the truth of that is through fictional characters. Because, because their passions can be greater than maybe, than maybe the, the, uh, an actual thing that happened to an actual person who survived. Their passions can be, can be so much uh, more enveloping for the audience. And once you've been sucked in via Jack and Rose, now you're on Titanic and you can't get off and you have to go through, you have to go through the whole thing. And, and uh, then these little sidebar things that are going on, like the captain's kind of you know, emotional implosion where he just sort of becomes catatonic over with the weight of what he's done, what he's caused to happen. Uh, you know, these things become more poignant as well. I think they sort of, it's like a feedback effect between, you know, the, the fictional love story and the, and the, in, the inherent poignancy of all, of, of all these real stories. But then your fictional Romeo and Juliet only work because they are surrounded by fact. Right, exactly, because you're, you're believing what's happening. And, you know, I think people who haven't seen the film, you know, and, and, and want to be sort of wags and detractors of the, of the project have said, well, we know what happens. The ship sinks. You know, what's the big mystery? I know the story. But I think the irony is that when you actually are watching the film in, in, the, in, the, in the experience of the film, that certain knowledge of what is coming, informing every scene, no matter how innocent or no, ma no matter how unrelated to the disaster it appears to be, somehow gives it that extra edge. It, it sort of turbocharges the emotional response to all these other, these other scenes that are happening in, say, the first half of the film before they've even hit the iceberg. You're also the filmmaker who said 80% of the people working in Hollywood earn money off things they had nothing to do with. <laughs> do you really correct. <laughs> give a damn what critics or anybody in the inner community of Hollywood says about Titanic? Well, I, th you know, look, I, I think that, that we're, we try to be thick-skinned, but obviously, you know, criticism is important because it's the place in which, you know, when the average person sees the film, uh, they may not be able to art articulate so much what they were feeling and experiencing, and it's through criticism that we, that we, that we get an articulate form of feedback uh, as, as a filmmaker. We, we, we are able to determine whether specific things that we have tried to do, specific flourishes or, 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 or whatever, are actually working, you know, because you're into the, into the minds of specific people who know, who know how to art articulate them. I mean, obviously, the great equalizer uh, when you're making a populist film, which I think this is, um, is, the, is the, uh, the box office. And if people are liking the film, uh, then um, it, it's all justified. It's all OK. But you know, I, th I don't think that that justifies some of the, some of the, the shoddiness in, in Independence Day just because it made a lot of money, you know, quite frankly. And I don't usually diss other films. And I like that film. I enjoyed it. But, but it's not a film I could have made. Uh, you know, so, so with Titanic, I think, yes, I, you know, we do want to make money with this film. It is a piece of mainstream filmmaking. It is, it is a film for everybody. I say it's a film for everyone who's got a heart, you know. 
so in theory, it, it should be quite successful. But um, you know, I think it is important to, to, to read the criticism and see what people are thinking as well, you know, in, in, in a more articulate form. Good to see you again. All right, good to see you too. I wish you well. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Jim. That's it for this edition of Linehan. Thank you for joining us. Just remember, Jim Cameron, during Christmas of 84, you were the man who said, oh my God, Terminator's opening. They've got 2010 and Dune. We are doomed. Right. Who grossed the most? Yeah, yeah. Well, we did prevail in that particular. That was a tough, that was a tough season, actually, for science fiction. Oh, yeah? And Wait till this one. Right. The little sleeper that came from, <laughs> came from, from nowhere, you know.